Welcome back to Fake Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections. We're going to talk today about the implications of the elections in Taiwan. Wow, important. Okay, and for this discussion, we have Carl Baker, the Senior Advisor to Pacific Forum. Welcome to the show, Carl. Ah, good to be back, Jay. It's always good to talk to you about current events, and uh, certainly uh, Taiwan is a uh, big topic these days. The big topic, and relatively speaking, is a little island. A little diplomatic um, object, uh, you know, in the, the global environment. But let's let's talk about um, this election. Uh, it was not a perfect victory, was it? No, it wasn't. Uh, I mean, you know, it, I mean, it perfect, perfect in the sense that it certainly wasn't a resounding majority. He won forty percent of the vote, and the way the elections work in Taiwan, that's good enough when you have. Two other candidates that get less than forty percent. Yeah, they 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 actually are talking about trying to change that. It's the uh, first past the post system. Mm -hmm. The first first past a certain post, I guess that's plurality, and that you win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you know, so this is this has been a, a an issue in Taiwan in the past. Is that you have three candidates and uh, and then you get somebody with less than fifty percent of the country representing the country, but. You know, I mean, it's uh, the other, I think probably the most significant that, that I think of, of, regarding the election is that this is the first time a president has won for the, for the third time around. It's always been ever since they, they started the, the elections, the president has always served for two terms. This time, the DPP served for two terms and it won again. So now, because it's, because it's term limits of two, two terms, this is the first time that they that the incumbent party has been able to maintain power for the third time. That's what's significant about it. And how long is the term? Uh, four years. Yeah, four years. So so eight years. So this will be twelve years under under a president from the DPP. Okay. Um. And um. What's his name? Lai Lai Ching Te. Mm -hmm. Um. I guess, you know, one interesting point about this is the run-up, because although uh, the United States warned China not to interfere in the election, China made a lot of comments about Lai ching Te and, uh, in order to undermine him. Do you, do you recall what, what was happening there? Well, yeah, I mean, Lai ching, Lai ching Te has got an, a history of, of calling for Taiwan independence. Actually, he's, he's moderated his view quite significantly from the beginning of the Tsai administration where he was the vice president. And so, you know, in, in his early days, he was very much a, a strident uh, proponent of, of independent Taiwan, and he's actually backed away from that. And so, you know, that's what made him more palatable to, I think, the common people in, in Taiwan. But it also made him a lightning rod for uh, Chinese hatred because of the statements he had made earlier in his life about uh, Taiwan independence. Yeah, she called him a uh, person who would um, undermine the peaceful um, situation and and lead Taiwan into into violence with China. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think uh, that was not only because he believes it, if he does, but because he wanted the people in Taiwan to vote against him, and, and voting against him would be voting against war, and nobody likes war. Yeah, I mean that certainly is is the way that the Chinese, um, whatever you want to call it, propaganda, uh, disinformation, misinformation uh, operation tried to portray him as as the 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 problem the problem maker and not the problem solver because they really wanted to see a a, a KMT Guomindang, uh candidate Ho Ho Yi win because they see the KMT as the legitimate counterpart to the Communist Party in terms of a dialogue between parties rather than the country of China and the country of Taiwan. And if you remember, this goes way back to 1996 when, when Li Denghui originally said it has to be a state-to-state -state discussion, not a party-to-party -party discussion. So KMT didn't do badly in this election. They came out with, what, 52 as against the 51 votes for the KPP? Right, for, for the, for the uh, 
for the DPP, right? DPP. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, they they t- they have fifty two seats in in the legislature. That's right, to the fifty one for DPP. So they, they they have a basically a hung a hung parliament in the sense that that the the woman dog has the majority, and but they're going to have to play with with the TPP, the Taiwan People's Party, because they have twelve seats and then there's two independent seats. So so there has to be some some coalition uh, to to be able to to move something through the legislature at this point. But certainly the DPP is at a disadvantage because it is one one seat short of what the KMT won. Yeah, I, it would take 57 votes to uh, command a majority mm. out of 113, I think. In any event, uh, how likely is it they're going to be able to build a consensus among the two the two parties? Because in the past, they've been real, re- relatively successful in domestic issues, but who knows now? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's going to be a problem. And I think, you know, that, that the, the fact that, that the KMT did as well as it did in the legislative elections, I think, says something about the concern in Taiwan about uh, going too far, being too, too assertive, uh, because the, the majority of the people in Taiwan want to maintain the status quo. And what that really means is different things for different people. But essentially, they they recognize the values and the and the benefits of what they have now versus being a part of one one country two systems that they saw in Hong Kong and yet they don't want to be so independent that they end up in a war with China over over the concept of independence so this is all about trying to hold on to the status quo about about who about Taiwan holding on to the status quo. Yeah, I mean, I mean, China, China wants wants to change the status quo, of course, because they they find the status quo increasingly unacceptable. Because you know, for the DPP, the way they characterize the status quo is is we are independent by virtue of the fact that we have our own government and we don't need to just declare independence. So the way they see it is is we are independent. We aren't just we just aren't going to say it. You know, before the show, I. I asked Alexa uh, whether uh, uh, she's going off again. I asked Alexa wh- wh- whether uh, Taiwan had the ability to hold off the Chinese, and she refused to answer me. Oh, uh, so let me, let me ask you: Does Taiwan have the ability to hold off the Chinese? Well, I, I mean, that's uh, that's an ambiguous. I mean, I I would give you the same answer as Alexa, saying it's a really <laughs> ambiguous question. Because I don't know. I mean, what do you mean by hold off the Chinese? Well, uh, it'll de- de- deter an attack. Um, uh, you know, beat back an attack. Well, I mean, I mean, in 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 absolute terms, no. I mean, China has nuclear weapons. It could it could uh, you know explode a nuclear weapon and destroy Taiwan. I mean, as as a simple answer. Now, can it can it withstand a a full on conventional attack from from China? Uh, yes, I think it can, but I mean, I, again, these these are sort of sort of absolute terms when you start talking about military capabilities. I mean, the the fact is is that I think China rec- and China recognizes this that even if you have a military victory, it's, it could very well be a very pirate victory because you destroy all the infrastructure that Taiwan represents. So you can have you can have a, a burned out Taiwan, and and you can call it your territory because the people are all dead. Or the, the people are are you know have no have no economy. There's no there's no infrastructure left for people to drive. You know what do you mean by by success in that in that kind of a war? I guess is what I'm saying. Is is yes, I think China has the capacity, just given the size of the Chinese military and the and the potency of Chinese weapons, they can destroy Taiwan. But the, again, it becomes a very pirate victory. And and if it's not a pirate victory, if you if you manage to Take control of the government. You have 23 million people who are not going to be very happy living under a government that they don't recognize as being legitimate. Now let's talk about those people. 23 million people. They have a culture of democracy. They have been wedded and enthusiastic about democracy for a long time. Um, is is that built in, or does that change? You know, um, the, uh, the the third party you mentioned, TTP, was it? Um, that 
that's very young and they may have a different view of things. Um, and maybe they don't care so much. There was a 60 minutes uh, production on this issue uh, last year, I think it was. Uh, well, everything was last year. <laughs> Um, and uh, they, 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 they reported that the, there was a fair amount of complacency in Taiwan. In other words, people were doing well. They wanted to you know, continue to do well, but they weren't going to get too excited about China. Um, mm -hmm. What do people think in Taiwan? Well, I, I, don't, I, mean, I don't care to be the spokesperson for, for people in Taiwan because I, there's obviously a wide variety of, of views. There are some, um, mind Joe, certainly believes that we should move toward a better relationship with mainland China. I mean, he's made that very clear, and he was, you know, just in recent weeks, he was making that that case for the KMT to to move more toward his his view of, of establishing economic relations and all that. So there, there's, a, there's a wide variety of views. But I think, in general, the statement you're making is correct, that that there's there's very much a satisfaction with the status quo, with with not trying to to go too far one way or the other, and so I, I think that that is the general view. Uh, now, I would I would challenge a little bit the the solidity of the democracy. You know, everybody everybody is quick to say, "Oh, it's a, it's a culture of democracy," but you know, as we've seen in other democracies, sometimes that that democracy is a bit more elusive than what we thought it was. Uh, yeah, you mean so, like in the United States. Uh, yeah, that would be an example. Uh, yeah, so you know, and and certainly there are accusations of voter fraud in in Taiwan. That, that, that I mean, the government's doing a pretty good job of keeping that quiet. But if you if you get into the social media accounts in Taiwan, there's people who are showing that there that there may have been some some irregularities in the voting and all this kind of stuff. And and certainly there's there's a, a dislike for. The DPP, and that's part of the reason why they explain that the KMT was as successful as it was in the legislative elections because there is a dissatisfaction with the current government, with with the government as itself. So, so I think you know to say that there's a there's a a, a strong culture of democracy. There certainly is a, an appreciation for democracy, but there's also a lot of challenges to the institutions associated with democratic governance in Taiwan. You know, um, we know that uh, China is into hacking and, for that matter, into uh, hacking social media in this country. Um, and we know that Joe Biden said China st don't interfere with the Taiwan election. But I, I have a little trouble accepting that China did not interfere, did not mm. involve itself in social media. I have not seen any reports. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I mean, I, the, the, what comes to my mind is is that uh, in a meeting in Taiwan uh, last last year, I remember listening to someone talk about the number of attempted intrusions on government computer systems in Taiwan last year, and it, it's in the thousands per day. I mean, it's it's a crazy large number, and so I I, I think there's no doubt that that China is not only trying to infiltrate the social media. It's also working very hard at, at, at cyber intrusions in general. So th th there's no doubt that they're trying to influence Taiwan. You know, and, and I mean, originally it was, you know, Taiwan or China recognizes that it has to seek the or gain the acceptance from the people of Taiwan. And then it becomes a question of how do you do that? And, and of course, one of the ways to do that is the way everybody has decided to try to influence people. It's through social media and through through disinformation, misinformation. So I, I think there's no doubt that that in many ways, Taiwan has become a poster child for uh, you know cybersecurity. Let's turn to diplomatic relations for a moment. As I was telling you before the show, uh, all, all the very important topics that my wife and I discuss at breakfast, lunch, and dinner in our home, uh, Nauru is not one of them. However, not. Nauru is is a part of this little story, isn't it? What happened? Well, yeah, I mean, the day after the election, Nauru uh, switched its recognition of Taiwan to China. And by the way, this was they did this before, and then they switched it back. Mm -hmm. So you know, so this is a small Pacific Island nation who sees the advantage of 
appealing to China for infrastructure development, for development assistance. You know, and 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 this is they've, they've called it uh, you know uh, dollar diplomacy, or you know uh, basically buying small countries. And when you look at the lineup of the twelve countries that still uh, recognize Taiwan over China, it's a sort of pretty small number. A couple a couple small countries in uh, Pacific Islands, uh, one country in in Africa, and then a few countries in uh, in uh, Latin America. So, you know, so, so yeah, there isn't really a lot of recognition left, but this is, of course, because of China's hard policy of the, you can only recognize one China and that, and that China is, uh, resides in, the government resides in Beijing. So you, you, if you're a small country and you want to, you want to get development assistance from China, that's what you have to do. And so there's always this competition. And in the past, you know, Taiwan was able to maintain relations with a large number of, of Pacific islands. They've, they've lost several of them now, Solomon, Solomon Islands recently, Vanuatu. You know, so, so they, they're moving away from, from, from being able to maintain those relationships with those small countries because China has become so big and so pervasive in some of these areas that they've been able to push China, Taiwan. Dollar diplomacy is a kind of corruption. I did. I did see an article which suggested that um, that in order to achieve this new liaison with uh, Naru, it, it paid Naru a hundred million dollars and made a promise that it would continue to pay that every year. Um, and a, a pay means uh, perhaps uh, helping them with infrastructure or loans or what have you to rebuild Naru from its previous economy, which is all about uh, guano. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. The the four thousand or thirteen thousand people in in Nauru are certainly appreciative of that don donation. I'm sure. <laughs> they had a you know they had a condo here in Honolulu. Uh, you know, I, I think it still is. I think it's still here. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, so um, so what you have is a a reduction of the number of countries, uh, both in size and and and. Scope around the world that do recognize and have diplomatic ties with Taiwan. Um, and this is, is sad because it does reflect a certain amount of diplomatic pay, pay as you go corruption. But but query, does Taiwan care about any of that? Should it care about any of that? What effect does that have on Taiwan? No, I, I of course Taiwan does care, and and if you don't believe it, you know just watch what happens when the uh, when when the, the Marshall Islands, uh, the president of the Marshall Islands comes to town, you know they 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 put on full regalia and do parades and all that kind of stuff. I don't think uh, they get the same kind of treatment when they go to Washington, you know. So so yeah, I mean it, you know I mean I think it does matter, but I, but again Taiwan has been very practical. In the way they approach it, and and they certainly have a very aggressive program in Southeast Asia for economic relationships, you know, and and they've and they've certainly over the last couple of years done very well with with the West, you know, appealing to the sense of democracy of, of the brotherhood of democracies, if you will, you know that that they've done very well gaining the attention of the Eastern European countries and and of of the United States, you know, we've we've changed a lot in the last five years about how we think about Taiwan. Uh, so I think, you know, I think the, the, the Tsai administration has been very successful in, in establishing relationships without talking about the formal diplomatic relationship. And so, you know, so they've, 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 they've done away with some of the parades and the, and the, and the, the sort of the ceremonial aspects of state to state relations, but they've done very well with the economic side of the relationships and, and, you know, and they've, and they've been able to, to get parliamentarians from different countries to show up. Obviously Nancy Pelosi made the big splash when she, when she went to Taiwan, you know, so, so they've done, they've done very well with establishing relationships short of the, the formal diplomatic relationship. I want to return to one thing and explore this thing with you. Um, you know, we talk about diplomatic relations, and and China is, you know, is trying to cut Taiwan off from as many countries as it can, to uh, you know, sever, um, you know, diplomatic relations. At the same time, we have 
Western countries that are friendly with Taiwan. I, you know, you, they don't have treaties, uh, you know, mutual defense treaties or anything like that, but they're friendly and, and they're providing economic benefit. And then the quad out there, you know, that's, that's a statement that we care about Taiwan and Taiwan knows it and China knows it. So what, what I'm getting at though, Carlos, is really interesting. You raised it in my mind when you talked about that. Could there be a new kind of diplomacy emerging here? You know, before it was formal diplomacy. Now it's kind of de facto diplomacy, mm -hmm. and and you want to achieve that just as much. But I could I be right about that? Oh yeah, I think I think you are. I mean, you know, I mean, we've created these euphemisms, so we don't have an embassy in Taiwan. We have the American Institute of Taiwan, which has a beautiful campus just off the just close to the close to the downtown airport. It's you know, and it looks an awful lot like an embassy. It acts an awful lot like an embassy. But it's called American Institute in Taiwan, you know. And and originally they were they former diplomats were posted to that organization. Now they are real, normal American diplomats. So you know, so there's been a gradual uh, movement toward more formal recognition. But yeah, I mean, it's all it's all informal. And I think I think you're right. Like I said, you know, there's there's countries in 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 Europe, United States even for that matter, Japan and the Philippines are sending people there, but they're, they're politicians They're they're not, they're not administrative, uh, branch people. They, they tend, or they're certainly not senior administrative people, but they tend to send parliamentarians because they are elected officials and they have much more freedom of movement. And, and there really can't be any complaint from China about that or not as much complaining from China about that. So yeah, it's a, it's sort of an informal diplomacy. And that's what I was saying is, is Taiwan has been very adept at, at developing those kinds of relationships. And, and so I think that, yeah, it is, it is a new kind of relationship. And, and that's, that's sort of the travesty to me of the, the confusion that we have between one China principle and one China policy. You know, and, and people tend to use those terms interchangeably. But the fact is, is that if you think about one China principle, there's one China. Okay, then what does that mean? You know, there's different different parts of China that, but there can still be different governments inside of that one China. Is it one China culture? You know, does it include the diaspora? You know, there's a lot of ways to think about that. But what's happened is everybody has sort of accepted China's demand that you accept the one China policy which then puts that, that principle into practice, which means you have to recognize the government in Beijing as the sole legitimate source of political control in this greater China. And that's where the constraint comes. In. So I think, you know, Taiwan in practical terms has played around in this area of one China principle and, and sort of ignored the policy side where Beijing has always played very strongly on the policy side. You have to accept Beijing as the sole legitimate government, and that's the end of the story. There is no no flexibility there in terms of how the principle gets implemented via policy. And ignored the ruling of the International Court associated with the UN on the South China Sea and uh, the jurisdiction of the Philippines. Uh, ignored it completely, even though they were a party to the uh, the court the court jurisdiction and agreement. Um, so I wonder where the United Nations, I mean, I feel the United Nations is a failing organization. That's just my opinion. Um, but where, where is this whole affair between China and Taiwan? Where, where does it sit with the United Nations? Well, remember China, China took the, 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 the UN seat from Taiwan in, in 1971 when, not 1970, I think 1973 is when that occurred. But, but I mean, they, so they took the seat. So the UN has, has consistently refused to hear the appeals from Taiwan based on, on the fact that there is only one China, that they accept China as a legitimate representative of, of China at the UN. So, so the UN, the UN is, 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 it doesn't, I mean, every, every year it's introduced at the, at the general assembly by the friends of Taiwan, but it, 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 it has no, it has no standing within the UN and, and 
of course, Taiwan is not part of any UN treaty. Is that the right thing for the UN? I mean, it's, I mean, you could. You could I'm argue. sorry, I asked you that question. I know it's a hard question. Well, it's 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 a it's a question that that can't really be answered because the UN is what it is, and and the the there is an agreement that China represents that that the mainland China PRC represents China at the UN, and and yeah, I mean Taiwan puts forward the the resolution every or someone puts forward the resolution on behalf of Taiwan every year. But again, there's no, there's, there's nobody at the UN that's going to say yes, we agree, we should, that they, we should give Taiwan standing within within the UN system because it, it there now, is no basis for it. Brings us to the United States, which is uh, does not have diplomatic relations with Taiwan, um, and does not recommend, as Joe Biden said a few days ago, uh, independence for Taiwan. Where where do we stand? I am frankly very confused. Well, I mean, you 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 get into this litany of of the three of the six assurances and and the the Taiwan Relations Act, where the United States basically says we we agree that there is one China, that we do not support Taiwan independence, that we will support Taiwan. With military equipment, based on its needs to defend itself against uh, outside invasion. Uh, what else are we missing here? There's, uh, there's. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the of the other, the other aspects of the, of the six insurances. Uh, they won't exert pressure on other. They won't. They won't involve themselves in the negotiation between. The PRC and and the and Taiwan they won't they won't uh, promote in, in Taiwan independence. So you know so all those all those things sort of lead up to the idea that the United States supports Taiwan in the sense that it wants to have Taiwan make its own decision on how to reconcile with with the PRC. But ultimately, it it's it's locked into the idea that there is one China that it has to it, it has to consider how Taiwan and China interact in terms of the military and in terms of finding a peaceful solution. But ultimately it's about, you know, the United States promotes peace and stability and it will not involve itself in issues of sovereignty regarding uh, the, the 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 island of Taiwan and with China. Will will we defend Taiwan? Well, that that's of course is is the the difficult issue. You know, the, the, they've Biden on several occasions has said we will defend Taiwan, and and it's that's that's sort of a bold statement because we 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 say that we will we will help Taiwan resist an invasion a, a military invasion. So will we defend Taiwan? Uh, Back at back in the old days, it used to be we would, but only if it's an unprovoked attack. And then it becomes a question of you know what is an unprovoked attack? Is is it is Taiwan declaring independence an unprovoked attack, or is that a provocation? You know, it gets into 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 the very very murky area of what what is what is the cause? You know, what is what is a provocation? What isn't a provocation? What is what is a, an unprovoked attack? What isn't an unprovoked attack? So it's it's a very it's a very murky area that that we're in when we when we ask that that seemingly straightforward question. How, how does this election affect relations between the United States and Taiwan? Well, I don't I don't think it affects it very much because because the United States has become closer to the to the DPP in some ways. Than it was to the KMT because the KMT has always been more more aligned with with China and more willing to to work with China on on issues not related to politics and and diplomatic relations. Where the DPP has always has always looked to the United States. And it, in fact, there's a kind of an interesting uh, survey that was done where it shows that that the people in the DPP tend to believe the United States will come to the defense of Taiwan 
rather than the KMT, which is more skeptical about the U.S. coming to the defense of, of Taiwan in, in the event of a, of a military uh, confrontation. So I think, yeah, I think the, in, in some ways, and it, and it isn't if it's a conscious or if it's an unconscious sort of drift, but I think the United States has become more comfortable with the DPP as its political partner than it was with, say, Mon Joe and, and the KMT back before uh, 2016 and, uh, and signed Wynn's election. You mentioned earlier that um, there was a turn limits issue, and this was the last four years uh, that the DPP could, could run things. Um, what happens during that four years and after that four years? Uh, how, how do, what, what's, what's the likely evolution politically and diplomatically with China? Well, I mean, but let's clarify. The DPP has been in power for the last eight years. And, and so this was, in the past, it's always been the KMT had power for eight years with Lying Joe, and then, and then Tsai Ing-wen came along and was in power for, for eight years. Prior to Mind Joe, it was uh, Chen Sui Ben, a DPP party who was in power for eight years. So when I'm talking about eight years, it's that's been that's been the cycle. And then every eight years there was a there was a shift to the other party. This time around is the first time that the DPP has won a third iteration, a third time. So that's that's what I mean when I say term limits. Tsai Ing Wen can only run can only be president for eight years. So we had to find someone new to run. So, so Lai represents the first time the DPP has won in a year where the, it, there was not an incumbent available to lead the party. What we see now is, is that the, there is very clearly a move in Taiwan to the, to the middle where there's no longer the belief that they need to continue to talk about reunification, that there's, there's a, this development of a Taiwan identity that is is not part of the mainland China, you know, and this is just simply because the the, the Chinese that came uh, after the war in 1948, 1949 are are now becoming Taiwan citizens. Their, their kids don't recognize themselves as being mainland Chinese, and so they they are are developing very much a Taiwan identity, and it's this this sort of weird identity that says, well, we really like the status quo. We recognize that China is is uh, feels that it has sovereignty over Taiwan, but we really see ourselves as, as Taiwanese and, and would like to keep the status quo. And so I think, you know, with the DPP winning yet again, but with KMT being uh, in power in the legislature, you know, we'll continue this sort of uh, murky gray area where everybody wants to maintain the status quo. And basically what that means is economic well-being freedom of expression and and sort of sort of placating the Chinese to the extent that they have to but also don't forget that the the economies of Taiwan and China are very intertwined that that the, the you know that, that the idea of, of Taiwan severing itself from from mainland China is not realistic there's there's a huge amount of trade that goes on between these two countries or the, between, I'm sorry, between these two entities, she said, I better be careful. Oh, my, my, watch out there, watch out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so I mean, Thai and Taiwan recognizes that. You know, and there's any number of, of Taiwan factories that are still in the mainland, on the mainland, making making a lot of money. And and so, you know, so they're, they're, they're not going to, just like the United States and China are going to have a very difficult time trying to sever all economic ties, Taiwan even more so. You know, so so I think you know the way I think the way Taiwan sees it is we can continue to do this, and and China is going to have to figure out how to get the people of Taiwan to accept it, it as as the ultimate sovereign power over the land territory we call Taiwan, and and they're not in a big hurry to have that uh, resolved, and and China on the other hand has has kind of taken the approach of, well, we can bully our way into it, but they recognize that that really doesn't serve their long-term purposes of a peaceful takeover of Taiwan. So, you know, so that, that I think, I think China is as conflicted about this as, as Taiwan is. It's just that you don't see it in China because, because of the, the suppression of, of, of media and, and the control of information. 
But, you know, uh, a peaceful takeover wouldn't be the same as it was uh, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, clearly, the, the, the PRC has taken control of Hong Kong. Um, and, you know, they, they really dictate lots of human life in Hong Kong. But they wouldn't be able to do that so easily in Taiwan, right? There, no, there, is, some... there, there is a strait, and there is a, a difference. And, uh, and and they can't just walk across a bridge. They, they can't control it the same way. Am I right? No, I think you're absolutely right. And, and you know, and Taiwan learned a lesson from, from Hong Kong. And that's why, you know, China can no longer talk about one country, two systems in, in Taiwan. It simply is, is a complete non-starter. And, and China, I think China recognizes this, that, that, that they, they were aggressive in, in Hong Kong because they were worried about the signals that they were sending to, to, to Taiwan, but they were willing to go into Hong Kong and take over. And, and basically, you know, there's a Chinese saying, you know, kill the chicken, scare the monkey. You know, and, and you know, and I think that that in some ways they they saw they saw the, the option of show them show them that that they can be very very assertive in Hong Kong in the hopes of scaring Taiwan, you know, and and I think that that you know that 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 is is their hope of what they tried to do in Hong Kong, but they recognize that that they that by doing that they've sort of have, have foreclosed the idea of a one one country two systems. Uh, approach to to Taiwan. Yeah, one last thing before we before we break, uh, and that is uh, the economy. Um, you know, uh, Taiwan has the chip company, Taiwan Chip Company, mm -hmm. uh, very very profitable, unique even, um, and um, desired by by China. Nobody has a chip company like that, and um, um, and they and they have they're prosperous. They, they've thrived over the past few years. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that affect the election? How does it affect things going forward? Well, yeah, I mean, that's sort of, that's sort of the, the essence of, of Taiwan, is it's been very successful economically, and so the people are very satisfied with what they have. And that's why they all say, well, we really want the status quo. But by status quo, what they're really saying is they want economic prosperity in a, in a, in a system that doesn't suppress uh, their freedoms and doesn't doesn't uh, force them into 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 state-owned enterprises and all that. I mean, uh, China or Taiwan is a very entrepreneurial country, or a very entrepreneurial place, and so you know, so so they 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 like that, and they and they see that as as very the very essence of of Taiwan, and and so you know, again to 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 reiterate, you know, they they. They recognize that they need Taiwan or they need China economically, but they also recognize that they need to expand out. They need to diversify, just like all the rest of us do, with China. But their 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 essential capacity is in their economic strength, and you know, and that's and that's why you know I, I, to to get to the D TPP, we haven't really talked about who they really represent, but you know, Cohen Jet the. The leader of this TPP party is is really a sort of a populist, and and one of the one of the things that that he has complained about, of course, is is the government and the and the corruption that is in the government. I mean, that, surprise, surprise, there is corruption in Taiwan, you know, and and so there is this concern that the the economic growth has to be systematized and has to be integrated into a social system that allows people to prosper and you know and so they you know taiwan faces all the same problems all the rest of us do with with an aging population you know with with a, 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 a infrastructure that needs to be kept up with with social programs that support the the elderly all those things you know so they have all those social problems and 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 the economic dynamism that promoted taiwan to where it is now in terms of a, a you know what the tenth largest economy in the world is is something that that they need to maintain to make sure that they don't lose that uh, dynamism. And Lai Ching Te has to maintain it too, because he'll be measured by the quality of you know the economy going forward, as yeah, yeah. as he was measured uh, in his statements about the economy in this election. Yeah, increasingly, it you know as 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 
most democracies they they become you know entangled in this in this domestic policy that actually drives the elections in the end. Yeah. Ah, interesting. We have to keep watching. Carl Baker, Senior Advisor, Pacific Forum. Thank you so much for helping us understand what's going on there. Thank you. Aloha.